Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews It. Dan does Disney, and uh, we see our friend Tim again over Zoom. Hello, Tim. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is time now to talk about, uh, I think, probably one of the, the true live-action classics from the Disney uh, vault. Probably the most classic we've talked about, maybe except for 20,000 Leagues. What do you think? Yeah, besides that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are talking about Old Yeller, and uh, mm -hmm. I happen to have this actually on a two-disc. It's Old Yeller and the Old Yeller sequel, which is called Savage Sam. But uh, as we might find out, I, I think Old Yeller's probably not in it. Uh, uh, so I guess we'll get to that. I think that's maybe uh, 1959, maybe? I wasn't aware of that sequel. Oh, yeah. Big time sequel. And it's the same kid in both. And I think he's still just about that young. So I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, as we might learn, uh, a lot of these actors uh, are in different Disney things as we move forward here. Um, but of course, Tim will get uh, a little more into that uh, with the background of the film. But uh, so this came out in 1957. Uh, at the end of the year, and it is based on the 1956 Newbery Award winning book, Old Yeller by Fred Gibson, uh, who actually co-wrote the screenplay as well with uh, this dude, William Thunberg. Uh, and I couldn't find any stats about how much uh, the budget was on this, but it made $5.9 million, which was pretty big at the time. Uh, and then they re-released it again in 1965, and it made another $2 million. Um, this was added to the Library of Congress in 2019 for their National Film Registry. This is the uh, oldest of any of the live action Disney movies uh, to get that. Now, a lot of the classic animated ones are in there. Snow White, Pinocchio, uh, Fantasia, um, Dumbo, Bambi, I think as well. But uh, none of the ones that you and I have talked about, Tim, have made it. I'm surprised 20,000 Leagues isn't underneath. Uh, under the sea isn't in there yeah you know i'm surprised at, at, at that as well i went over the whole list uh by year like by year of release so i could make sure that that was a correct statement but yeah apparently Twenty Thousand Leagues is not in there um which yeah you're right that does seem like a, a a pretty obvious choice i guess but of course this wasn't added till two years ago so obviously yeah, there but i mean Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea was one of the first like cinema scope movies. That was like a big thing that we talked about, and all the underwater shots and stuff like that. Like, yeah, that's true. They did the uh, the cameras that they made just for the underwater scenes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, may, you know what? Let's petition them. Twenty twenty one will be the year, I guess. Um, this also has a little bit of a legacy. Obviously, it's you know kind of known uh, throughout the world here as this big you know, sad movie, uh, which I sort of, I knew some, I knew what happened, but I didn't know exactly the, the means that it happened. So I was a little taken aback by that, but, um, this was made into a comic book series in 1957. Um, and of course the, the sequel Savage Sam, I guess, which we'll talk about. Um, and I actually learned a lot about, um, some other things with this movie because this two disc collection, uh, both movies are actually on disc one, disc two is all of these extras. So I spent uh, a large portion of today watching uh, a bunch of the special features that we'll talk about later. But um, this was filmed largely um, in California. It takes place in Texas, as Tim will tell us about, but it takes place largely in California. And uh, it is the first movie, apparently, that was filmed at this uh, Lloyd Earls Golden Oak Ranch uh, in California, which Walt Disney bought two years later. And uh, there's a featurette about 15 minutes long on the DVD that takes us through um, sort of a tour of this ranch. And uh, they talked about some of the movies and TV shows that have been filmed there. And it runs the gamut from Gunsmoke to Big Top Pee Wee to Back to the Future 3 uh, to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So a lot of different things have been shot here whenever they need, I guess you know, covered barn or, or an old ranch house or an old bar scene or whatever. Um, it actually said Back to the Future, Tim, but I assume they meant Back to the Future 3 because that's the Old West. Yeah, but I mean, 
Back to the Future has some like isolated areas, like uh, probably. Oh, like, you know what? Pe- Peabody Farm, maybe. Peabody Farm, maybe the some of the shots where they're building the development or something like that. That they need a wide open space for the the new development that's not built in 1955. Oh uh, yeah, Lion Estates when they were still Lion building it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Okay, I'm, you you could be right on that. So maybe maybe that was not a slip of the tongue. Maybe it really was. For, I forgot about Peabody's Farm too. Um, yeah. So uh, a couple of the background things. So um, we'll find out about some of the animal violence and uh, fight sequences in this movie. But uh, apparently, the uh, American Humane Association, uh, which I guess now is called the Humane Society, but um, was was on hand to sort of guide all of these different scenes and uh, there's a, a wolf that fights in this movie that we'll hear about but uh, that was actually not a real wolf that's a different dog uh, it was a German shepherd made to look like a wolf and uh, both very trained animals also uh, a little bit of an interesting factoid so the um, the the people that trained old yeller the weather wax training family also trained lassie oh. so, yeah, there's uh, so there was an interview on one of the special features with the son of the the Weatherwax family, and he was like, "Yeah, I literally grew up with Lassie and Old Yeller," um, and some other interesting things uh, that that this is not one of the old books that Disney grew up with. We've talked a lot, Tim, about these books from Walt's youth or um, whatever that he bought, you know, long before. But uh, this is one of the few movies in history where the book and the film came out within about 12 months of each other oh i wasn't aware of that yeah um so i thought that was kind of interesting as well um and the uh the the design is very intricate in this film as well the uh the the cabin is right down to like the details of of what might have been in a cabin back then but even down to like what silverware they were using things that we didn't even really see much of but they were still you know laid out so uh you know walt was uh and his crew were taking a lot of care to make sure this was very very authentic which i mean we've seen you know davy crockett and some of these other you know historical things but obviously this is not based on a real person like david crockett was but um i think i feel like the the attention to detail on this was maybe a little greater than some of those, you know, because David Crockett was, of course, a TV show originally. Um, so it seemed like he was really taking details uh, seriously on this movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of also reminded me of Peter My Heart. I felt like that was very well done of, like, you got the feeling that they actually lived there. Yeah, which, which actually makes sense because, right, that was a, a movie based on a book that was very you know, near and dear to Walt's heart and everything. Um, and also there was some uh, discussion of if they wanted to change the ending of this uh, movie. Um, and look, you know, I think we can all say Old Yeller dies at the end. You know, we all know this. Um, but there was some discussion of whether or not they wanted to uh, actually keep that in the movie or change it completely and uh walt was firm and was like you know what uh this is what happens in the book this book is beloved by everybody i think you know people are kind of expecting that this is what's going to happen and so uh you know it ended up being one of the one of the darkest really of all the disney movies uh certainly in the live action realm yeah i mean uh i mean disney doesn't shy away from darkness i mean bambi's mom die but usually it's earlier in the film yeah usually it's early in the film that's what i was gonna say yeah (laughs) usually it's either like before we even start watching or like in the case of bambi it happens like kind of in the middle um but yeah this is like the second to last scene basically um but uh yeah that's that's about uh, all i have on the background believe it or not there wasn't too much i mean most of what i gleaned was from the uh, bonus features i could not find too much actually online uh, which surprised me. Yeah, I, I couldn't find much either. I, I I went through IMDb and there was some trivia stuff there and I didn't even write half of it down. Yeah, well, they talk about Friends, the yeah. uh, the old Phoebe connection on uh, IMDb. But yeah, like the wiki has no background information at all, basically. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about some other things, I guess, uh, from the DVD set. But let's uh, 
Let's hear, Tim, about the uh, plot behind this classic film. Okay. So it's based off a novel by uh, Fred Gibson um, called Old Yeller as well. It takes place in the 1860s. And you have a young Travis Coates, um, and he's left to take care of the family Texas ranch with his mother and younger brother, while his father goes off to on a cattle drive to uh, actually make the money and uh, enter Old Yeller, a yellow mongrel dog that causes destruction while chasing a rabbit and getting onto Travis's bad side. However, Old Yeller just won't leave and quickly starts to grow on Travis as he proves to be a loyal, brave dog to have around. Uh, after a series of scrapes with um, raccoons, bears, wild hogs, and a wolf, Travis finds himself loving and respecting Old Yeller, um, who comes to be a pivotal um, part of Travis's life. And uh, there actually is not too many uh, side characters at all. There's like no extras in this movie, no background players. It's really just basically the family, a couple other people, um, so, and that's it. So the cast, we have uh, Tommy Kirk. Um, he stars as Travis Coates, um, and he will go later on to star in Swiss Family Robinson, um, Babes in Toyland, Absent Mind Professor, three other Disney movies, and um, probably a couple other ones as well. The Shaggy um, Dog. And uh, I guess the Shaggy Dog as well. Yeah, he's the son. I stopped writing them down after like three. I was like, okay. All right. <laughs> that, that's where I know him from because I, I've i never seen Old Yeller, but I grew up with the Shaggy Dog. And uh, he's the one. He actually turns into the dog. I think in the, the newer version, Tim Allen turns into the dog, right? Yes. The dad. I, but yeah. I haven't seen either it, one. So okay. I, now, <laughs> but, I, I, but, right? I have previews, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the original, the, it's the son that turns into the dog, and that's him. Um, but this is um, the first feature of his, but he did do um, a Hardy Boys uh, miniseries for the Mickey Mouse Club TV show. Um, okay. I don't think they made those into movies like they did Davy Crockett, but um, but yeah, so he had a little bit of history there. And then the little kid that you'll tell us about, he was also uh, one of the Mickey Mouse Club players at the time. Yeah, so Tra uh, 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 Tommy is a great young actor, and he, he carries the film, basically the whole movie, with Spike the Dog, who plays Old Yeller. Um, you have uh, Fess Parker. Um, uh, he uh, plays his father, um, Jim Coates, um, and he has a mustache in this movie. Makes him different than Davy Crockett. Yep, mustache um, Parker. He's he's different, Tim. Yep, um, and he's not <laughs> in this movie that much, Besides being top build, I don't know if he's first build or second build. The first names are him and then um, Dorothy McGuire, um, who plays Katie Coates, um, which is uh, Travis's mother. Um, but Fess Parker goes away and then he shows back up at the end of the movie. Um, so, yes. But, fake mustache, by the way. Oh, fake mustache? Oh, I didn't, didn't even grow his own mustache, Tim. Maybe he can I don't know. Maybe he can't. Listen, uh, he apparently shot his scenes literally in like two days. <laughs> he shows up at the beginning, shows up at the end. Um, I, is this his, is this his last? No, I think he's in at least one other thing. I think. Um, All right, now I got one look. He does a typical Fess Parker, um, which is which we have said mo numerous movies now in reviews. It's a good job. It's a decent job. It's just the same character, um, and it it it's the same thing. It, it's 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 a decent performance, and uh, he has he has decent chemistry with the uh, the Dorothy McGuire character who plays his wife, and he has decent chemistry with uh, um, Tommy Kirk as well as his son. Yeah, um, he gives him some advice, and um, it's but it, it's, it's always the same. The, the 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 speech is always the same yeah. the, the tempo is always the same he doesn't change his voice or inflection no um so uh darth mcguire is the mother figure who's more prominent in this movie um and yeah she, she does a really good job being being a the, the mom um being concerned about her kids and also uh letting boys let let uh her little son uh be wild and free at the same time 
She's um, actually first build uh, on the DVD and on okay. the background credits. She's the first build. So this is was her first Disney role, but she was in like a bunch of other movies before this. But then after this, she became a Disney regular. Um, she's also in Swiss Family Robinson. I think both of the kids and her yeah. are in Swiss Family Robinson. Yeah. So uh, the other kid is uh, Kevin Corcoran or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Cochran, and, I think. Or Cochran. Um, and uh, his character is Arliss Coates. Um, and he also is Swiss Family Robinson, like Dan said. Um, and he doesn't do a bad acting job. I just find that um, his character is a little annoying. Um, but I feel like that's supposed to be his character as the annoying little brother. Um, yeah, I, I really did not like his acting. I was surprised that, uh, Disney went with him for many other roles, but, um, in one of the special features, they, they talked about the director told him that basically he should, uh, never stand still, always keep moving and being energetic and being kind of in everybody's face and stuff. So I guess that was what he was supposed to be doing. Yeah, like, I don't think uh, his acting, I don't think his acting was bad. I just think he was an annoying character. Um, yeah. I think he did a good job at being an annoying younger brother. And because we've seen bad acting before, and it yes, was really seen... not that bad. I mean, no, like, it wasn't as bad as What's His Face in Treasure Island. No. Um, and like, when they were when they were really young in uh, what was it uh, Song of the South and they both him and Luana Pine they were young and like they did okay I feel like he was just on par with their performances. Yeah, I guess so. I, I feel like uh, because though Tommy Kirk is so good, yeah, and he's only really I don't know four years older maybe. I mean he's not that much older. Uh, it, by comparison, I just yeah it's it's unfortunate and I, and I, like like we're saying I, I don't necessarily think it's Cochran's fault as much as it is the the way he's supposed to be portrayed in the film yeah but uh but yeah Tommy Kirk's so good that it's it's hard to compare yeah and then so we get the the other three side characters that the only other three people see in the movie basically um and we have uh Jeff York is back um and he plays um um Bud Searcy um and he's the local who stayed behind while everybody else went on uh, the, the cattle drive to basically check in on all the families and stuff like that. But basically, um, they left him behind because he's a, he's a lazy, quick-talking freeloader. Um, and he does an amazing job at being this character. Love and him as always. It's so different than the other characters that he play. I mean, maybe there's some similarities we, between like Fink or something like that, but the way he delivers his dialogue, the way he even kind of looks is slightly different than um, the other characters he plays. I, I think Jeff York is um, quickly one of my favorite Disney regulars right now. Him, he is one of the most underrated ones because nobody has ever heard of him. Nobody's, I mean, Fess Parker, maybe you've heard of, certainly, you know, David Crockett, but like this guy's now been in what five of these movies? I think Two this Davies, is Great Locomotive. This is his fourth one. Yeah. The fourth one. Okay. And, and, and this. And it's like each of those characters is, is pretty different. Yeah. And they're all great. I mean, he, he really, he's a scene, he, a scene stealer, especially next to, the old tried and true Fast Parker, which, like you said, he's fine, but he yeah. is exactly the same in every movie. Yeah. Um, and then you have um, Beverly Washburn plays his uh, granddaughter, um, and that's Lisbeth Searcy. Um, I don't know if it was the way she was acting or her character, but I thought her character was kind of very bland. Um, the only thing she had really going for her is that she has a crush on Travis. Um, and is trying to um, win his heart. Yeah, this is clearly a boy and his dog movie. And, uh, you know, let's have some girls in it, I guess, anyway. But, like, yeah, her character was basically irrelevant. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I imagine her character was in the book as well. I just probably is the same amount maybe and maybe there's just not much to the character and she didn't really have much to work with um yeah. i mean he's definitely there in a lot of 
scenes, it just seems like she's so bland that she kind of like blends into the background sometimes. Yeah. And I don't think she became a Disney regular. Mm, I I doubt it. it. Doesn't yeah, it doesn't look like no, she didn't do hardly anything. Uh I mean I think I looked yeah. her up. I think she's still acting. It's usually just like one off episodes and stuff like that. Yeah, the last thing she did was in twenty sixteen. So she's she's still alive. She's in her seventies. So God bless her. Yeah. Um, hey, she was in that show, Professional Father. Wasn't that a, <laughs> that was a trivia question we had recently, Tim? Professional Father. She was a regular on that show. Oh yeah. Um, and then the last person you have, you have um, Chuck Connors. He plays Burn Sanders, and he is um, Old Yeller's previous owner. Um, and he tries to get him back, but then uh, he lets the boys keep him when he finds out that. Uh, uh, the boys like him so much. Um, mm-hmm. And then also, he warns Trap about the hydrophobia, which is going around, which is rabies. Yeah. And, and we, we, had you ever heard that name before, by the way, Chuck Connors? Um, no, I have not heard the name Chuck Okay. Because you're a baseball fan. He was part of the Chicago Cubs team in the 50s, but... Uh, yeah. I know him because he was the star of this TV show called The Rifleman that was on like five years. Oh, yeah. uh, and I've never seen it, but it started the year after this. So I don't know if that this was sort of his foray into acting and that helped him get the role. I don't know, but he's OK in this. Yeah, um, I thought the the standoff between him and Arliss, um, I thought that had a lot of great camera shots in it. Yeah, and they actually talked uh, about that a little bit in one of the features because um chuck is so much taller he's like six and a half feet and you know the little kid is a little kid but they decided to even go like further with it and yeah do all these shots like looking up at chuck and uh you know him looking down on the kid like he's you know two feet tall yeah i i agree i thought there were some interesting uh shots that they used in in that scene and that's probably the the best arliss scene in the whole movie yeah. So I and the, I felt like that scene was probably for him well acted. So that's why I want to go on the like the side of saying that he was kind of directed to be annoying, and it wasn't really his acting that was bad, uh, because I thought he did a really good job in that scene. Yeah, I, I would agree that that scene probably does clinch it that it's more the uh, directing and the writing of the character, um, and as we'll see, I mean. We'll see his acting progress, I guess, the next few movies. Yeah, he was in Swiss Family Robinson and then a handful of other Disney I forget what they were, but um, yeah. he definitely is in a couple of Disney movies. Um, so, uh, like Dan says, um, it's not a happy ending in this movie. Um, and uh, I feel like I would have been a little bit more emotionally affected if it wasn't for that Friends episode where it is revealed what yeah. happened movie so i knew what was happening you don't know the specifics of how it happens but um it kind of prepared me for it so um it wasn't like me watching marley and me the, for the first time and i'm like falling my eyes out Wait, um, did you not know marley dies at the end of that movie no oh i, I watched that on video so i already knew because it had been out for a while in theaters I did know i still bawled about it but i i knew marley died at the end for sure um, and I knew Old Yeller died, but I, for some reason, I didn't know it was Travis that had to kill him. And you pointed out Phoebe does say Travis in, in yeah. Friends, but having never seen Old Yeller, I didn't know Travis was the kid. And I had forgotten kind of that that was the line. So when he's the one who has to put Old Yeller down, I was just like, oh, man, this is like horrible. Yeah. Um, so... Uh... There's a lot of animals in this movie, um, and they got great animal footage. Um, I feel like that it's somewhat on par with some of the nature, like adventures of some of the footage they have with the animals. Um, they have some. Did you think there was some shots of squirrels running around? Did you think they were leftover footage from Purry? <laughs> you know, I didn't, but now, but now that you mention it, I could totally see that. That would make sense. I mean, um, 
that scene that was probably one of my least favorite scenes in the movie i felt like they could have cut that scene completely out because it doesn't affect the movie at all no um, you're right um but i mean because i was expecting like because travis gets distracted by watching these squirrels and then there's a deer over there and you think he's going to miss the deer and i was expecting like maybe old yellow to come and like nudge him and be like hey there's a deer over there but doesn't old yellow's not there it, he kills the deer and brings it back, and then he yells at Old Yellow. Like it, 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 it did come out the same year as Perry, so uh, you know I wouldn't be surprised at all if they did that. But one thing I thought was really interesting, um, you know, you mentioned we've seen a lot of the stuff in True Life Adventures with animals fighting and stuff. I do think that because they had all this this background knowledge of like, okay, this is what this animal looks like fighting this animal, or this is how these guys act in the wild. I do think that. Um, you know, a lot of the standoff sequences or whatever is probably pretty authentic to uh, to real life. Yeah, I thought they did a really good job dealing with the animals. Um, they are obviously very well trained. Um, and like you said, yeah. wolf wasn't actually a wolf. It was a dog dressed like a wolf or not really dressed, but kind of made to look like a wolf. Um, yeah, I thought all that was good. Um, Some of it was pretty gory, though. Yeah, especially with the pigs. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's some, some vast landscapes, and the landscapes are good, um, well shot. Um, there's, it's a good drama. It's very emotional. And there's some humor in it as well, um, especially all the, a lot of the scenes with Jeff York um, has some humor in it. Um, I thought all that was really good. The only really flaw that I have besides the squirrel sh scene is that um, – it's really heavy on the foreshadowing. Yeah, that's true. It's super heavy on the foreshadowing. It's like after um, uh, Chuck Connor comes around and mentions hydrophobia, hydrophobia is mentioned, at <laughs> least, I would say, six more times in the movie, like, if not more. All right. Well, here's uh, you're not wrong. I just feel like, A, this is definitely for little kids. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like because it's based on the book, um, a lot of people were probably already familiar with the story. So I feel like maybe for those that didn't read the book or didn't know the story, they, they wanted to kind of hammer home, okay, here's what to expect. Um, I, don't, I don't think I disliked it quite as much as you, but yes, there is a lot of foreshadowing elements here i mean it's not like i hated it i just thought it was pretty heavy for 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 a while <laughs> very yeah. heavy spectrum yes um well uh, yeah like i'm trying to think have we seen that much foreshadowing in any of these other disney live action movies maybe not no and even uh, yeah I, even in like the like, let's talk about Bambi for a second. It's like, oh, don't go in the meadow. The man is evil. Like, maybe that's mentioned a handful. Like, maybe don't go in the meadow, like, a couple once times. or twice. It's not, like, six times. And you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. That was a little overkill, too. Yeah, I just thought it was a little heavy. I mean, it's, uh, like, I these days, if something's mentioned once and then kind of moved off of it, everyone's like, oh, I wonder how that's going to affect <laughs> Like the the rest of the movie, yeah. Um, well, that just that just got brought up. We watched the uh, 2011 Muppets the other day, and that just got brought up as oh, that if I didn't know any better, that sounds like a you know plot point of exposition. Yeah, yeah this movie had a lot of that. Um, I did like the the direction of this. So uh, Robert Stevenson directed this, who uh, actually his first Disney movie we have yet to get to because it's Johnny Tremaine. But um, okay. he's gone on to direct a lot of the Herbie movies. He did The Absent-Minded Professor. And he was nominated for an Oscar for Mary Poppins. Okay. So this was one of his first Disneys, but he became a big, big Disney uh, favorite the next, you know, 20 years. Yeah. I, besides the foreshadowing, which probably wasn't even his fault, it's probably mentioned the source material. Yeah. Time. Um. Like, I thought it was very sol solidly shot and made, and um, it's a decent movie all overall. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really liked the scenery. I liked um, the, you mentioned the chemistry earlier. I do think that certainly the brothers have great chemistry. Um, so you could see why they, you know, got them to act as brothers in several other features. Um, but um, what did you think about the mom? We did, we talked a little bit about her as an actress, but the, the character of the mom, because um, it really is to me, a boy and his dog and I guess the boy's brother and she is in it and she has things to do, but I, I don't think her character is even that fleshed out either. Um, it's a little fleshed out. Um, like I feel like the scenes with Fess Parker where she's talking to Fess Parker in before he goes on his trip. And when he comes back, obviously there's a lot of love there and she's worrying about, about him not being there. Um, but I bring you the dress about the dress and things like that. Um, I think she shows a lot of concern over Art, how he's getting into trouble, and that's why she wants this dog around is because she thinks that um, it could help him. Not knowing that Travis is going to fall more in love with the dog than Arliss is. Yeah. So I think she like she she's a, a basically a single mother at this point, caring for two uh two young boys on this ranch where i mean yes travis is old enough to do a lot of the work but i mean she's out there sawing up uh trees um for the new fence that they, they have to uh that's true we, we do see her doing a lot of work around the yeah. farm yeah so i i think yes definitely there could have been more to her character but i feel like for a movie that's focusing on a boy and her, and his dog um that she's her uh she, I, she does well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily a fault because clearly it's it's not about her. But yeah, I, I thought, yeah, the girl almost had no character, but then yeah. I, I thought the mom was was kind of basic as well. Yeah, but I mean... But... She's the typical basic mom <laughs> yes. in 50s movies. I mean... I, I That's think, very true. Do you really get more than what she did? In the 50s as a mom? Not generally, no. I guess that's true. Even yeah, in TV shows where we've seen the mom in 200 episodes, I guess we don't get much more than that sometimes. Yeah. Um, I so. mean, it, she seems well-educated for... Not, like, educated in, like, like going to school, stuff, but educated right. on farm life and how to take care of the boys in the 1860 Texas branch um and yeah she certainly knew how to how to maintain the family with fess parker gone that's true yeah and she obviously was smart enough to know about hydrophobia and taking precautions at the end of the movie and things like that well she heard about hydrophobia so much in the movie yeah Tim, i she, know but <laughs> she, 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 knew she had to pick up on it somewhere yeah so uh, uh did you read about any differences from the book and the movie? Uh, no, not really. And they didn't talk about them on the DVD either. What, uh, what's different? So it's pretty accurate. Um, the description of Old Yeller is a little... Uh, uh, I, yeah, I did know um, that. The, he's, yeah, supposed to have stubby, he's supposed to have a bitten down ears and a stubby tail. He doesn't have a long tail. Um, but And he's more of a mongrel, like they said, in the song that introduces him. But, I mean, he's being portrayed by, I think, a golden retriever in this movie. He's not, he doesn't look like a mongrel at all. No. Um, yeah, the trainer said they actually don't know what he was because he was a mutt, but they assume that there's a lot of golden retriever in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, he l didn't look the part, but, I mean, that's typical of any movie that gets any casting these days anyway. I remember when Hunger Games got cast and Jennifer Lawrence, like, got picked apart because... Like, they're like, oh, this is what I think Katniss Everdeen should look like. <laughs> yes. Um, so that was one thing. Um, there's apparently a bullfight in the movie. Uh, besides the, oh. besides the, the cow, like, after Travis, there's, a, like, a bullfight that um, gets affected. Like, he has to, they have to shoot the bull as well because the whole hydrophobia as well. Oh, um, wow. Does Travis shoot the bull, too? Yep. Yeah. Besides, oh besides shooting out earlier, that he has to shoot a bull as well. Um, okay. And then 
the only other difference was at the end of the movie that they don't wait for the inc- incubation period. Like they don't wait the the months. Oh, trying to see if uh, Old Yell is going to make. It. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I actually I must have heard that somewhere at some point because I I did think that was odd. I thought that he got killed pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I I think that might have been a little work. I mean, obviously, he wouldn't have been showing sy- symptoms at that point. Yeah, that's true. And then um, I think it would have been kind of like open ended. Oh well, did he get it or did he like, like? I think yeah, this is kind of cut and dry. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's no mistaking it in the film. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, all and right. I, I like. I thought that scene was also really good at the end too. Like. Um, leading up to everything where like um Arliss is trying to get to old Yeller and oh no what's gonna happen? because I didn't know what was gonna happen. Like I like Yeah. Like I wasn't sure if it was gonna be a little bit more um tense or anything like that. But I did think that scene was was pretty pretty tense and like, oh wait, what's gonna happen type of thing. Yeah, I agree. The last fifteen minutes of the movie is is really you know, especially I, you know, imagine seeing this and you didn't read the book and you didn't know what happened. I mean, imagine seeing this in a theater, you know, you take your family to it. Uh, you know, I know many people of, uh, you know, our parents' generation were, were probably very, very scarred by this film. Yeah. I mean, they're like, I remember watching Finding Nemo in theaters. Like, obviously, I, I was old and like a packed theater. Like, I was, I mean, I wasn't old, but I feel like, like, Probably, probably a teenager college. when that came out, right? No, yeah. I, I feel like or maybe a, maybe a high school college, um, okay. and uh, that like once that barracuda was there, like in the beginning, like kids started falling and screaming. I was like, man, what did I get into? Like, um, yeah, I feel like people Part are was intense. Like, so. yeah. But uh, but that's the thing. It's movies like this and Bambi and stuff that kind of set that template for like stuff happens in Disney yeah. movies that maybe yeah. we, we don't expect. Um, and, I, you know, they seem to get away with it more than any other studio, for sure, with kids' movies. Because they sent the chaplet with Bambi, and you're like... Yeah. <laughs> right. When, it, when it, you know, it can't get possibly much worse than Bambi, so they just sort of... That was the template, I guess. You're right. Yeah. Um, all right, so before we grade this movie here, um, I do want to talk a little bit about this, uh, this package that I have. Um, so... This is actually one of the, the most released live action Disney films to uh, home media. So it uh, appeared first in the early 80s, 1980 and 1981. It was on CED, Laserdisc, and VHS. CED is that thing that I discovered that looks like a record, I guess, that was horrible and only happened for like two years, but a lot of Disney movies were on it. Um, and then uh, this, by the way, the 81 VHS is the very first. Uh, Disney VHS to have the Buena Vista logo on the case. Oh, yeah. Uh, Because it was released before a lot of the other Buena Vista ones we've already talked about. Um, Then it was released in 91 on VHS and Laserdisc, 94 as part of the Disney Family Collection, 97 as part of the Classics Collection, and then in 02 it made its uh, DVD debut, and then I have the 05 edition, which has the Savage Sam sequel on it, Um, and then there's one Blu-ray version it is a Disney Movie Club exclusive, um, and that came out in 2015. I don't know if that has extras, because as we've discovered, a lot of the Disney Movie Club exclusives are just the movie. Well, I mean, I imagine <laughs> something like that would have it, because, like, I mean, the So Do You To My Heart was Disney Movie Club exclusive, and that had a few that things That had a on. couple of things. Yeah, that's true. Um, so this, this is really kind of stacked here. So... Um, it has uh, Bone Trouble, which is the very first Pluto cartoon. I guess the tie-in is the Pluto's a dog. Okay. Um, but that was from 1940s. So that was kind of interesting to see. There's a 36-minute feature called Remembering Old Yeller. And uh, it had interviews with pretty much everybody that was still alive. Fess Parker, uh, all the kids who are now adults, um, and then the son of the uh, author of the book talked yeah. about it as well. Um, so that was pretty interesting. It really, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff there. Um, there is a uh, seven minute 
Lost Treasures uh, trip to the Golden Oak Ranch that I talked about that goes over all basically the the different parts of this ranch, not just what Old Yeller was filmed on. Um, and for movie historians, it is pretty cool to kind of see the, the different, uh, you know, movies and shows that took place there. Um, there's a four minute Disney studio album, 1957, which a couple of these I've seen now, I think there was, there's one in 54 or 55 as well, but basically it's just like a montage of every single thing that Disney released that year, whether it was movies, um, you know, TV shows, commercials, you know, um, so that's kind of cool. But then there is a 15 minute interview with Tommy Kirk that actually is less about old Yeller and more about his career as a whole with Disney. So it takes you through a lot of his other roles as a minded professor and stuff. And he sort of talks about how he got the job in the first place on the Hardy boys and how he sort of made his way into the Disney family. Um, they signed him for a seven year contract and he ended up doing eight years worth of movies because Disney liked him so much. Um, so that was all very interesting. And then there's a whole nother section, which is like the production archive of old yeller. And it takes you through, um, you know, all the ads for the movie, um, audio archives with like different sound effects, uh, features and stuff. Um, and then I love when they show the entire episode of Disneyland that has something to do with this movie. So there's a 57 minute episode of Disneyland from November of 1957 with Walt introducing old Yeller to audiences and, Oh, you know, here's what our next movie is going to be. Uh, and it includes a 1955 documentary called Arizona sheepdog, um, which Disney apparently didn't produce. Um, but Buena Vista did, so they paired it with the original Davy Crockett movie in theaters. Oh, no. Um, so that was kind of interesting. I didn't sit through the, the whole thing. It's like a 40-minute documentary. I didn't watch that. But it's pretty interesting. I, I enjoy seeing the Walt Disney intros more than anything. Yeah. Um, but so overall, I, I think this is a really cool collection. Uh, my only complaint really is that because they put both movies on one disc, um, it does seem a little bit like compressed so the quality isn't as good as probably what you watched on disney plus well yeah and probably i mean probably was a little bit remastered for disney plus like i feel like most things are. yeah a lot of the things are that's for sure um so that's that's really probably my only complaint about it but yeah there's a, a whole a whole treasure trove of things and and uh, i guess when we talk about savage sam i'll sort of uh, briefly remind everybody about that but uh, but yeah, so I, I thought that was cr pretty cool. So overall, I would give the DVD set probably an A minus. Um, but let's talk about the movie. Uh, I forgot we didn't mention one thing. We didn't mention um, the song. There, there. We didn't talk about the song. Yes, I guess. Yeah, you briefly had touched on it, but we we actually never went back to it. Yeah, the old Yeller song. They played it at the beginning and the end. Yeah, like a um, classic Disney. I, I. It reminded me very much of like Davy Crockett. Yeah, I mean, it was it was almost. I mean, it wasn't quite the same melody, but like almost. It it has a lot. Like if you told me that the exact same lyricists and musicians wrote it and worked on it, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah, instead of like David Crockett came with the Wild Frontier, it was like um, old old Yeller. <laughs> yeah, it was like be best dog in the land or something like that. Yeah, or, yeah, so. it's basically the same song. Yeah. And then at the end, they change it from old Yeller to young Yeller. Um, and so, oh yes, correct. Um, but he really he was old Yeller. Let's be real. Um, yeah, I, I I thought the song. I'm glad they didn't make this a musical. I'm glad yeah. that that was just that was the intro song. Fine, let's move on from there. Um, I think that definitely would have dampened the uh, you know the momentum of the film. Yes. If they kept doing songs. So I'm glad they decided not to do that. Um, but yes, it's basically Davy Crockett, but about a dog. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, then the only other thing I had uh, I wanted to mention was that Tommy Kirk is also still alive these days. Um, Tommy Kirk and uh, Beverly Washburn are the only living cast members. Oh, so, so the, the little kid's dead. Yeah. Kevin, uh, yeah, maybe it is Corcoran. I don't know. Oh, yeah, 2015. Well... Yeah. That is a shame. Yeah, Tommy Kirk, I mean, he must not act anymore, but yeah, I mean, all, all these interviews, I mean, this 
came out in 2005. So obviously the interviews are 15 plus years old, but uh, I actually didn't know Fess Parker was still alive then. I mean, he was probably in his seventies when he did the interviews, but um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to see, see old Fess Parker. Uh, Cause vocally exactly the same as always, you know, you, <laughs> you could tell a mile away that that's good old Fess, um, yeah. but he looked nothing like young Fess Parker, you know, he, you know, obviously fatter face, completely gray. Um, but yeah, as soon as he opened his mouth, you're like, yep, that's, that's Fess. All right. Oh yeah. But, um, uh, look, I think this is a true classic. Um, I, I think this is of the live action ones we've done. Um, I, I certainly don't think it's as, you know, uh, well done from a technical standpoint as 20,000 leagues. Yeah, I think that's probably our our gold standard of uh, what we've seen so far from the live action Disney's. Yeah, but I I feel like story wise, this is a little bit more concise, and it it I mean I feel like this kind of sets the template for like family type of movies going forward for Disney. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, most of the ones we've dealt with so far are either at least in the fifties are either documentaries or they're like those big, you know, English epics, yeah. um, you know, sword in the rose and that kind of thing. And I, I do think you're right. And actually one of the features, uh, Leonard Malton, the great Leonard Malton talks about how this really did usher in an entire new era of Disney filmmaking, yeah. um, which I think we'll see going forward because right. I mean, we'll see a lot of, not just animal movies, but yeah, like the, the whole family dynamic as opposed to, you know, Davy Crockett or Treasure Island, which is not so much family-based as it is adventure-based, I guess. Yeah, or I mean, like, going back to like one of the more recent movies, it's always like Western Ho, The Wagons, which felt like a little bit more episodic. Um, it didn't feel like as a full movie, um, but it also kind of, for being a, based off a book called children of the cover wagon kind of like glanced over the kids for a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's very that true. Park, where like, this was the kind of the mirror image where it was like, it glances over fast Parker and just focuses on the kids. Yes. And I think the movie is much better for it. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, I absolutely think this deserves to be uh, one of the high regarded Disney uh, classics. Um, I mean, I, I think I would give this an A. Yeah, I would give it an A. I mean, it, like yeah. I mentioned a few flaws in it, and then probably why I wouldn't give it an A plus. Um, and I mean, it for a movie taking place in the 1950s, um, if, or not taking place, but being filmed in the 1950s, um, the pacing is completely different than what we see today in a family right. movie. Um, but it's still enjoyable. It's still unwatchable. Uh, like I feel like kids these days could sit down and watch this and not be completely bored um, and find entertainment out of it before crying their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's true. I mean, of all the ones we've done, um, I think this is probably the one that, that could capture a kid's attention in 2021 the most. Yes. In terms of the live, the live action ones. Yeah. Yes. In terms of live action. Um, yeah. Not, so uh, all right. Well, so up next, I think we'll probably do Johnny Tremaine. Uh, if if I get it in time, it's still uh, being shipped to me in the mail. But then after Tremaine, is uh, that in the woods or something like that? Yeah, which I think I also don't have. But is that on Disney Plus? No. No. All right. So I I may have to get my get my first. Uh, full order from disney movie club right after johnny tremaine then too um all right well I i'm glad that old yeller though was uh finally recognized by library of congress i think well-deserved entry yes um and uh yeah so thanks tim for joining as always my pleasure and uh yeah we'll see everybody next time bye <laughs>